Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, I'm joined by Ms. Schneider from Market Gauge, who's going to share with us some of the charts top of mind for her, particularly in a heavy earnings week, as we have a lot of stocks reporting earnings, a lot of uh, stocks moving to the upside, others that are sort of sputtering and not really following through. What sort of uh, conclusions can we draw from that? Over, uh, overall, we're going to talk about the resilience of stocks, the S&P 500 testing all-time highs. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hey everyone, welcome to today's edition of The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a cloudy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we focus on the markets using the power of stock charts. We focus on the technical toolkit, how it helps us make sense of these markets in uncertain times. And I tell you what is not necessarily uncertain is the fact that stocks continue to propel themselves higher. I was screening earlier for my market misbehavior premium members on stocks making new swing highs and lows. Stocks making new three month highs and lows is usually a good starting point with which you can sort of make sense of things. Uh, at today's count, I had 150 names in my universe of US stocks making new three month highs. You know how many new three month lows we had? One. One, and it was a stock of NVAX in healthcare. And it's not even breaking down. It's kind of testing support. So not a lot of names, names breaking down. Plenty of stocks pushing to the upside. Really interesting today, though, to see the defensive leadership. The top two stock uh, sectors today, as the market's pushing onward and ever upward, utilities and real estate, fairly defensive bent to that uh, to the overall leadership, while technology consumer discretionary, some of the more growthy parts of the market's actually uh, down, net negative today. So a lot of interesting themes to, uh, to tease out as we go through our market recap here in a minute. I do want to let you know some of the guests we have coming up. I'm excited to talk to Ms. Schneider today on the show. Tomorrow on the 21st, we have Craig Johnson, the technical analyst at Piper Sandler in Minneapolis. Next week, a couple of good, uh, couple of good go uh, guests for you. On Monday, sorry, Tuesday the 26th, we have Roman Bogomasa from Wyckoff Analytics in San Francisco. On Wednesday the 27th, Pat Ceresna, co-host of the Market Huddle podcast. Also, our latest episode of The Pitch is coming up next, uh, next week on the 27th. That's going to be hosted by my friend and colleague, Grayson Rose, here at StockCharts.com. Three experts all pitching you their ideas. Greg Schnell, we have Mark Newton, and we have Jay Woods all uh, giving you five stock picks each. They will debate and discuss as a team, and, uh, and you will leave that special event with a list of tickers to dig into a little more deeply. So that's coming up on the 27th of, uh, of next week. Let's continue on today's show with our market recap. As I mentioned, sort of an interesting day, right? This is not the offense, everything's working, risk on over risk off type of feel to the tape. Uh, and, I, and I say that with the fact that utilities were up one and a half percent, real estate up 1.4%. Those are the top two sectors today. So, you know, overall, if you're looking for a risk on, you know, we're stepping on the gas type of uh, move. I don't know if I necessarily got that feel today. Uh, because those are the two of uh, the top two sectors, technology, consumer discretionary at the bottom list are actually down today. So while the S&P is going higher and again, only finished up about a third of a percent, but in the predefined alerts, if you can see on my screen, this is a, a really cool uh, widget to have on your dashboard because it, we have a bunch of predefined scans that are running and it tells you when anything is important that you should know about. So during the day, as I'm seeing stocks move uh, higher, I'm seeing the bullish percent index for the communications sector for the consumer discretionary sector, both going below 50%, which means over 50% of stocks in those sectors are actually in a point and figure bear pattern, not a bullish pattern. So this is not a broad all is well in communication services. It's actually showing you that more than half of them are in a sell signal that actually completed today. Uh, you have the NASDAQ going below a key level as opposed to breaking out. The NASDAQ was actually uh, down just a bit today, right? A rounding error below zero, but uh, for a little while, uh, trading below 15,100 earlier today. So, you know, and the NASDAQ bullish percent was what I, I got over here for was uh, went below 50% as well. So again, while I'm not struggling to find stocks making new highs, it tends to be concentrated right now in a couple of key sectors. Some of the leadership uh, sectors like financials and energy and industrials, that's where I'm finding a lot of new highs. 
I'm finding some in consumer discretionary and some in technology, but not nearly as much as some of those other sectors that I mentioned earlier. Mid caps and small caps, by the way, up just fine today and handily outperformed the S&P 500 with the uh, mid cap index up the most, up just under 0.8%. The NASDAQ down just uh, below zero and the VIX continue to come off actually uh, around 15.50 today. Interest rates actually uh, spent most of the day chopping around and 10-year yields finished basically where they uh, where they ended the day yesterday, just below uh, 164. And the bond prices, as we usually use the TLT as our proxy for bond prices, actually went lower through the course of the day, following through from yesterday's uh, distribution phase. So not really finding a floor yet uh, for bond prices and interest rates, I would argue, still have, have uh, plenty of upside potential from a technical perspective if you, uh, if you look at the chart of the TNX, for example. Gold and silver both positive, and actually all the commodities were up today, all the major commodities that we follow here. Oil prices higher, energy was about mid-range with the other 11 S&P sectors, but certainly saw a move higher in silver. That was the best of the, uh, of the bunch of uh, commodities that we track in this, uh, in this bucket, with the SLV up almost 3% today, where you are seeing plenty of upside follow through. If you're not seeing it in the equity markets, you are certainly seeing it in cryptocurrencies. So most coins up today, particularly the largest most liquid coins that we uh, that we track. Bitcoin is now above 66,000 for the first time uh, in the last 24 hours, pushing onward and ever up. Where we talk about the importance of that 64 to 65,000 dollar level. What happens on a day like today when Bitcoin gets well above 64, 65,000 is pretty much anyone that has bought Bitcoin before today is now in the green. We're all in uh, making a profit if you own it. I don't own Bitcoin right now, but if you do you're basically sitting on some sort of paper profit right now. And I think that does something psychologically to the masses of investors or really speculators, I could call at least some of uh, those participants who are sitting on a paper profit. And the question is, when do you start to recognize some of those profits? And that's when you can see some potential short-term weakness. But Bitcoin, Ether, most of the major coins that we're tracking up uh, in a pretty decent way today. Let's focus a bit on the chart of the S&P 500 here. And, and you know, again, I think we've We've now established that in the short term, the uh, the move has changed. The mood has changed really from a pattern of short term distribution in the month of September to a period of short term accumulation back in October. We have now experienced a raging, horribly negative pullback of almost six percent. And I say that with a great dose of sarcasm, right? If you look at market history, market pullbacks, market sell-offs tend to be a little more significant than that. We could absolutely end the year 2021 with nothing more than the five to six percent pullbacks that we've seen in February to March and here September to October. I don't know if that's going to happen. And at this point, I'm happy following the trend and seeing where the trends are leading. At this point, I'm seeing the S&P testing all-time highs, the same with the NASDAQ, the same with industrials and transports and sort of the traditional Dow theory and, and whether or not these indexes can push to new highs, I think uh, is the argument for whether we see a sustained bull move from here. What encourages me are all the indications of risk on versus risk off that you see actually making new highs. The uh, Aussie dollar to Japanese yen, AUD to JPY is making a new high today uh, or, uh, or this week. Uh, you're seeing uh, relative or, or, or uh, improvements in some of these uh, some of the charts that I mentioned, all these stocks making new swing highs, particularly in the financial energy, uh, financial sector, the energy sector, industrials, a lot of these making uh, making new highs. Where you're not necessarily seeing it are some of the charts like Facebook, which are really not uh, bouncing yet. They're sort of in pullback mode. And I think the question for some of the mega cap names, particularly the uh, the fan mag stocks or the fang stocks, do they find this support? Is the uh, is the downtrend over for a lot of these? They pull back to key uh, support levels, key long-term levels, like the 200-day moving average in the case of Facebook, became oversold for only the second time in 2021. The last time was back in January. Do we find a floor here and do we rotate higher? Does Facebook sort of hold that 315 to 320 uh, level? And again, that uh, moving higher, retesting the highs of 380, moving higher, that would uh, be the uh, the opportunity for a stock like Facebook to be back in a period of outperformance. At this point, it's certainly been one of the weaker names, particularly in that mega cap, cap space relative to some of the other stocks that have uh, just uh, overall been getting it done on a uh, on a relative basis. You know, elsewhere, when you look at what happened uh, today, you're seeing a lot of movements relative to earnings. I don't want to get too much into the uh, particular earnings stories uh, because we're going to do an, a segment later in today's show called The Bottom Line, where we focus particularly on some of the earnings uh, themes. The good news is we have there's so many stocks reporting earnings this week that I don't I'm not struggling to find a name to uh, to uh, to review. But maybe one that would be interesting to review from a uh, from a big picture perspective 
is Netflix. Talk about Facebook that's pulling back to its 200 day moving average. And my question on the chart of Facebook is, is the floor in, right? Do we find that, do we, do we hold that previous low that we've made recently? Netflix is maybe a little more uh, nuanced than that. This is a stock that broke out to new swing highs uh, in August into September. Uh, what we see on the chart of Netflix over the last year and a half or so is what I'd consider a basing pattern. And a basing pattern for me is when you've had an extended run higher, and then you go in this big sideways period. This is called a, a base where you have a resistance level that's fairly consistent. You sort of pull back a number of times. You have a number of failed attempts to try to get above that resistance, and you end up coming off from that. And, and, and in, in general, Netflix has been in a range from sort of 570, 580 on the upside and 480, 460 on the downside, even 500 here in July. Now that changes in September, right? Where we all of a sudden see a rotation out of that base. You make a new swing high. We retest the base of uh, the resistance here from above and then rotate higher. And at this point, it's coming off of all time highs uh, just above 640. Now we're showing some short term weakness. This is one of the names that reported uh, earlier this week. And, and uh, so far, you really haven't seen any, uh, any upside follow through after that earnings release. You're seeing weaker momentum as the stock is going higher. This reminds me maybe a little too much of this chart, Amazon. Uh, and if you rewind a couple months to back here, you had a very similar pattern where you had this 10 month basing pattern in Amazon. It broke out to new highs in July. This felt like it could go to the moon, finally getting above resistance, getting above 3,600. This has, a, you know, this can go much, much further, but then it sort of sputters, right? It becomes overbought, never really regains that upside momentum. And from there, you've actually re-entered the basing pattern where we remained for the next three months. So I think a chart like Netflix still has a lot to prove as to whether we sustain the gains above that previous resistance level. We need to take a quick break. We'll be back with today's guest, Ms. Schneider. We'll see you in a minute. Everyone, welcome back to the final bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. It's so good to have you join us every weekday after the close for our show. We'll get to my guest uh, today, Ms. Schneider, here in a few moments. Just a couple quick announcements before we do so. First off, we'd love to hear your questions, particularly questions that are coming up as you are analyzing your own charts, particular technical indicators you're trying to use, charts that are confusing you or you're kind of struggling to make sense of. Shoot us an email, let us know what you're running into. We'll do our best to point you in the right direction. Our email is the final bar at stockcharts.com. We are on Twitter at final bar SCTV. We're on YouTube. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our YouTube channel. We'd love to hear your questions and we hope to answer one of yours in our next mailbag segment on Friday's show. Also go to stockchartstv.com. That's our on-demand platform. We have so much great content coming out every day. Great hosts like Ms. Schneider and many other special events like the pitch and our year in review coming up in December and so much more. Go to stockchartstv.com or on your mobile device, just search on any of the app stores for Stock Charts TV On Demand. I wanna welcome on today's guest, Mish Schneider. Mish is the director at Market Gauge coming to us from uh, New Mexico, and she's the host of Mish's Market Minute on Stock Charts TV. Mish, welcome to the show. Good to see you today. Nice to see you, David. So, uh, you know, help us make sense of things. I mean, as we're looking at this market, there's been clearly a a change of sorts, a change of character, right? You had this big run into September. September is a period of, uh, of short-term weakness and all of a sudden we're rotating back and testing all-time highs. We're looking at the transport charts, uh, ticker IYT. Start us there, what are you seeing here? Well, when I was listening to you before, you used a uh, talk about intermarket relationships and how key they are. And so there are actually three that we really watch to determine risk on. One is the relationship between junk bonds and long bonds. The other one would be the S&P 500 versus the long bonds. And both of those are showing risk on. And the third one is transportation, 
versus the spy. So you can see that chart there on the bottom is the leadership, which is one of the, the plugins we have with stock charts. So what it shows right now is IYT is still outperforming spy. And the reason why I look at that as the ultimate risk on environment, if it maintains, is because transportation represents demand and let's face it, with all the supply chain problems and the labor problems and projections, that growth is not really going to happen the way they first anticipated with this whole return to normal scenario. The transportation is actually proving people a little bit wrong here. So as long as it continues to outperform, that ultimately is a really good sign for the overall macro and should keep the market firm. You see that flip? Then I would say that that's the first sign of warning that the S&P might be running a little too rich. Mm, that's great points. And all three of those risk on indicators, as you mentioned, all, all sort of rotating higher right now. Your second chart is looking at silver. Commodity space has been a really fascinating one. You have commodity indexes making new highs, but talk to us about silver in particular. How does this, uh, what does this mean for you? Well, the people who watch the show that I do with you guys every week know that I have been very bullish in a lot of the commodities, particularly the food commodities, but also the industrial metals, waiting so incredibly patiently for the gold and the silver to show some signs of life, with many crying out that they're dead and long live silver and gold. But regardless of whether you want to be a silver bull or a gold bull, to me, the most important is what happens between the silver and the gold. And those of us who have been around long enough know that when we are in inflationary times, the silver will outperform the gold. It happened big time in 1979, 1980 until the whole Hunt Brothers thing. And now what we're seeing here is exactly the same thing where silver is starting to take out gold in terms of performance. So you have this inflationary scenario which I believe is just getting going. It may rotate, but right now you can really see it here. And so I would keep my eyes on that. What we've seen over the last few years is you sell the strength in silver and you buy the weakness. Also watch for that because if silver continues to go up here and more buying comes in as it's going up, that would be another, not only a good indication for silver, but again, inflationary. Now, what can happen with the markets? And inflation, they can run up at the same time to a point. Of course, what do we know that point is? And that's when the Fed gets more aggressive if they do. Mm, it's such a great point. And I think a lot of people, a lot of times people try to simplify these relationships as much as possible. There are times when, you know, markets can go higher, inflation can go up and, and that kind of works to a degree, right? And then things start to uh, start to show some potential uh, challenges to that. We have a little bit of time left. There's obviously a heavy earnings week. We're going to dig a little later into some of the names that are reporting this week. But any stand out to you that you've, that you've noticed that you think are worth pointing out? Well, one would be Freeport McMoran, which is FCX. That reports this week, and it's sitting at a really good chart point. So if it can get through 40 after earnings, that's a commodity-related instrument. It's copper. Copper had a huge move and then a big correction, so I think that bodes well for that. I'm also really interested in American Express because I have this theory about going into this holiday season with the supply chain that people will be either buying early number one. And number two is taking advantage of the yields going up. And number three, possibly giving gift cards. So I'm really interested in Visa, but that's next week. Meanwhile, American Express is Friday. It's sitting really already at highs. And I think that can be an interesting momentum trade through 180. We only have about 30 seconds left, Mish, but I'm curious. It, it's hard not to be fairly constructive given all of these rotations higher. Charts like AXP, it's hard to be negative on the markets when AXP is breaking out, which it appears to be doing today. We, just with the time we have left, is there anything, you mentioned some of the risk on charts, is there anything in particular that you would be looking for to help you recognize when things are no longer going higher? What would tell you that we need to start be concerning would be some of those ratios that you mentioned rotating lower or a particular level on the S&P that would cause you to revisit sort of the bullish thesis here. Well, I definitely always like to watch the transportation and the small caps. So even though the spies are testing their highs right now, the small caps still have some catch up to do. So if they turn, that would be one thing. But I think of what we just showed you, the reason why I chose transportation is because if we cannot go into a holiday season with a robust demand and it starts to underperform the S&P 500, regardless where the S&P is, that would probably be the first sign of real caution. Mish, it's so good to see you. I really appreciate you coming on the show and uh, giving us some expertise. Really encourage everyone to check out your show, Mish's Market Mini. You, you share so graciously with 
your expertise, but stay safe, be well. Best to uh, Keith and the team there, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you so much. That's Mish Schneider. Mish is the director at Market Gauge, and uh, if, I, I feel like I could talk to Mish for hours just given her experience and her expertise, but I love how she was thinking about that, right? If you talked about you know, when we've been talking about the overall conditions and how they're evolving, you see how some of these risk on measures have just changed, right? The, the transports, which have been just such a, a rough chart at times, rotating high or breaking to new swing high, starting to outperform a little bit. Uh, she mentioned high yield versus, uh, you know, stocks and looking at uh, stocks versus bonds, some of these risk on measures that are certainly uh, constructive. And I very much appreciate her comment at the end, looking if transports do not participate, what does that tell you about the underlying strength of the economy, but at this point, it's hard to uh, deny charts like AXP just continue to move higher. It's it's uh, it's hard to ignore that evidence. Let's continue on with our next segment called the bottom lines. This is our regular uh, uh, effort during earnings season to dig in some of the charts. Uh, Mitch did such a great job highlighting a couple of those. FCX is a really interesting one to pay attention to, and I, I totally agree with that thesis. Can it get above the recent swing highs there and stay? AXP makes me want to get into some of the other uh, stocks in the financial sector. Let me get on the right screen here. When we're looking at the financial sector, a number of stocks have reported this week, and you will note a consistent theme, which is they're all making new highs. So State Street STT reported on uh, Monday. What else do we have? We have BK uh, that was uh, yesterday. It's Bank of New York Mellon. So we have some of the regional banks. What else do we have coming up here? Oh, the NASDAQ, uh, right? NDAQ. Uh, which is actually probably, I was, I was going to say, I'm, I'm, I'm looking as, as I'm talking, I'm looking through the list for something that's been, uh, that's actually been a negative suppression or negative turn. Uh, Zion is, uh, is another one of the regional banks uh, kind of making new swing highs. NASDAQ's a little different. And what's interesting about, about this chart coming down, it's uh, a couple of things. Number one, it's giving you a bearish engulfing pattern or a bearish outside day today. So this is obviously a stock that is uh, an outlier to the downside on a week and on a day when most everything uh, appears to be going higher, this is stock coming off. So short-term weakness. And, and when you have a day like this, a couple of things, it tells you the short-term dynamics are a little negative and the pattern I'm talking about, we can do here. This may be an easy way. Yeah, so it's not really quite a bearish engulfing pattern. That would be more if you have uh, an open above yesterday's close. So here's yesterday's close. You have a higher open and a lower close. That's called a bearish engulfing pattern. You can still call this an outside day, which is when the range of day two is wider than the range of day one. You have an up close on day one and a down close on day two. It's more of a traditional bar chart way of thinking of, uh, of uh, short-term dynamics. But either way, I think this is a fairly distributive pattern. I, I'd be looking for sure at the 50-day moving average, which is around 194.50, 195, and also at the swing lows. And I think that's probably most important. Can this hold 189? If you continue to see some short-term distribution, uh, that would be the uh, level of support I think that could uh, could certainly be coming uh, becoming a play. But this is coming after a really long term uh, trend of outperformance. So let's remember that that is a short term signal within a long term uptrend. Uh, year to date, Nasdaq has been one of the better uh, charts in the financial sector in terms of its relative performance. And this is in a group investment services that uh, is also. I'm trying to think if some of these other uh, you know, charts, MCO and others, uh, different groups, specialty finance, I kind of mentally group those together, but, uh, but uh, you know, some of these charts I think are worth paying attention to, particularly when the long-term trend has been so constructive. So overall, still I think a lot to like in terms of the long-term trend, it's whether it holds some of these support levels if you do see some further short-term weakness. What else have we seen report this week? So uh, United Airlines came up recently and I might've highlighted this on the show yesterday, uh, UAL reported after the close uh, yesterday on Tuesday. And to be honest with you, the way I would summarize my relationship with airlines, I find a lot not to like. And while I get into the idea of the reopening thesis, the long-term play that, you know, these are stocks that are beaten down, they're facing higher oil prices. However, uh, you know, if and when business travel reemerges as a huge uh, thing, once again, there's plenty of upside on stocks like this. I get that argument. But I have to go back to the technical argument, which is the charts not going higher. That argument for me works if the charts rotating higher. And at the beginning of October, when you had UAL breaking above swing highs, getting back above the 200 day moving average for the first time since early July, that's when I started to buy into the long term upside thesis. Personally, I'm not traveling at all for work and very little for uh, personal uh, stuff outside of driving my car within the uh, Pacific Northwest. So, you know, I, I think there's still a lot of, uh, of uh, lack of, uh, of certainly business travel and uh, demand for air travel 
But I think the, the way that I will be convinced that that is an emerging theme worth playing is when the chart starts to reflect that. The opportunity to break to new highs in, uh, in early October to get above the 200-day moving average really didn't materialize and, uh, and UAL is coming, uh, coming off once again. So uh, I, I would pay attention to those charts to see if you can put in a high or low. Can you remain above the July, August, September swing lows? That's around 42, 43. Uh, but at this point, the fact that it's been underperforming so consistently is probably what's the most damning part of that chart in, uh, in my opinion. I have to give props to, uh, to Tesla. I think it was really noteworthy when we recorded the pitch uh, last week, uh, Tom Boley, who's been a Tesla bull for as long as I can remember the chart, um, you know, has, uh, you know, given the opportunity to pick Tesla as his favorite chart uh, between now and the end of the year, did not go with it. He went with, uh, with uh, Microsoft, if I remember right. Uh, however, I think, you know, again, we were, that's, uh, that's, with a little bit of uh, a little bit of humor, because we were only picking one stock each to uh, to sort of uh, to to anticipate a higher move through year. And there's a lot to like on the chart of Tesla. And he was not did not make a secret of that. The relative strength in Tesla has been strong. The continued move higher is what's been most uh, important. And what what I think is interesting looking at this chart versus the chart of the ARKK, right? Similar charts up until sort of June July. You can see how Tesla has materialized or has continued to propel uh, uh, higher and gone up, 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 upside momentum, right? Stronger price, stronger relative arc, which arguably I think you, know, you, would, you would assume those have very similar return profiles, but actually not the case, right? Uh, arc given the opportunity to break above March and April highs has not done that yet. And it still remained very, very low. It's still mid range for where it's been uh, overall in the year 2021. So in general, stick with stocks that are working, stick with stocks that are actually breaking out to new highs. And Tesla has certainly been able to do it. The challenge for Tesla, along with the challenge for the S&P and all the other things we would talk about, can it get above the highs from earlier in this year? For Tesla, that high goes all the way back to January, which is around 900. Can it get above 900 and stay there? That would be the breakout level. That would be the point at which all the Tesla investors that bought somewhere in here are now completely in the uh, in the green, as well as the Tesla investors that bought it back in January and February. So a key level on a key stock they report after the close here today. We need to wrap today's show. Boy, there's so many earnings to go through. We'll have to leave it there, though, and go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one is the uh, Aussie dollar to Japanese yen. You can use that ratio by doing dollar sign AUDJPY on stockcharts.com. I'm showing that ratio on the top and just showing the S&P 500 at the bottom. Um, my guest today, Ms. Schneider, outlined some of the risk on indicators. And I think that makes a ton of sense. Looking at some of those macro gauges to see whether or not they're confirming the strength that you're seeing uh, in the short term in stocks. AUD JPY is basically a, uh, a general measure of risk using the currency markets, the strength in the uh, Aussie dollar versus the Japanese yen. That ratio making new highs is a very classic risk on measure. If you look over time in general, it's mapped pretty well to the S&P 500. It sort of became disconnected here June, July, August, but re-emerging stronger Aussie dollar versus yen and stronger stocks. And overall that ratio breaking to new highs is a classic risk on signal that a lot of uh, institutional investors still uh, would follow. Chart number two is Tesla. There are a lot of stocks reporting earnings this week. I, I like Mrs. Mrs. take on some of those charts like FCX and, uh, and others. Uh, I would look at uh, Tesla right now to see if it's able to eclipse 900. We are at the resistance level. The question is, can it get above that resistance and hold it? This chart, I think, is a classic illustration of an uptrend that goes more into distribution mode. You have a consolidation phase, which lasted about six months. This rotation that you saw June and July is an important one. And I think hitting the resistance in June and July, breaking out of that pattern, breaking above 700 in August, and then following through to the upside, bouncing off moving averages, and now Breaking above there and holding those uh, those levels is really, really key. At this point on a chart like this, it's had a really good run. And the concern is, is it sustainable? The question number one, can it get above the January high around 900? Question number two, can it hold that? So we're at a key level. It's a great time to be watching Tesla with a little more of a, of a fine focus and see if you can uh, establish that. Now, that brings me to my third chart, which is Netflix. This is a stock that has broken out. Think of that, again, different return profiles in Tesla, different chart, but you know, broke out. It actually did break above that resistance level that, that had been holding for about 10 to 12 months. Broke above that resistance, held that on a pullback, and now it's rotating higher. But the problem this week is we have earnings. This is, a, for a lot of stocks, this is the opportunity to really follow through to the upside. You think of those charts that have those quarterly gap where it jumps higher, continuing to push higher onward and ever upward 
uh, given the uh, the strength uh, that earnings are telling you. We're not seeing that follow through yet with Netflix. Does that happen? Does that emerge through the uh, through the rest of the week, folks? That is our show for today. Special thank you to Ms. Schneider from Market uh, Market Gauge joining us from New Mexico, sharing us her thoughts on earnings and risk on. Ladies and gentlemen, from everyone here at StockCharts.com, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe, have a great night. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.